William Tucker is a journalist. I've been a journalist for 25 years. I started as a newspaper reporter. I moved up to magazines, uh, writing about energy and the environment. And I've sort of been in and out of the subject for 25 years. Uh, I did. I remember picking up a copy of Amory Levin's book, Soft Energy Paths, from 1976, about six years ago, and saying, "Boy, that's a real period piece. People are going to be." wondering why that book was ever written. And now, <laughs> suddenly, the whole issue has come back and uh, energy is on everybody's mind. So I'm writing about it. Uh, I, I had long had in mind uh, that, that, that uh, when people talked about alternative energy and solar energy, and they'd always group geothermal in there. And I knew enough about it to know that that geothermal is not solar now. That the whole point of it is it's it's nuclear, it's it's uh, uranium and thorium, and I was going to introduce that in the book. I had it in about the middle of the book when I talked about geothermal, and I said, "Well, this is really nuclear energy." And then as I thought about it more, and this often happens with stories and books, you realize that's the core of the of the book and so I gradually moved it up front and then I and I remember sitting there thinking what can I it's not solar how what earth energy or something and then I thought terrestrial energy and it's a bit of a mouthful people say it's hard to pronounce <laughs> but and people say oh they'll think you're talking about extraterrestrial energy or something but uh, people seem to have absorbed it and, and I think it's the appropriate I'm trying to make it appear what it is, which is a natural phenomenon, and I think that's worked so far. The general public, the average, average, average person, uh, I've, I've always, uh, my, my parents are wonderful people, they, they did not have, they did not go through higher education though, and I, uh, when I went to college as the first person in my family, I, I spent a lot of time trying to kind of bridge the gap. Uh, and, and, you know, explain things to them that uh, uh, they wouldn't necessarily be familiar with. And I've always kind of felt that was my audience, that I, I was trying to explain it to people who didn't, you know, weren't necessarily going to have it all in their heads beforehand. Well, it's, it's a bit of both. I, I start with, uh, when you're writing, that's the nice thing about writing a book, is you're free to take a point of view. And, the people who write history get to make judgments about history too. And in this instance, I think, uh, although I certainly started out in, in favor of, of nuclear power, I really didn't know that all the detail, you know, that much detail about it. I kind of left that part for the for the end of the book, uh, for the end of my my understanding of my research. And uh, so I. I uh, um, I, uh, what was the question? <laughs> I can move on. Um, can you describe a little how you came to your position on transition? Oh, is it advocacy? Yes, I, I, uh, I, I started as an advocate of nuclear, but I, I had to be absolutely factual and absolutely cautiously researched every single aspect of the, of the issue because people are going to raise these questions anyway, and there's certainly been the, the exhaustive debate on it. And I just felt I, I like to just take things methodically and deliberately and cover absolutely every possible aspect. Like it's like preparing a court case or something. You want to know all the questions, the answers to all the questions before somebody asks them. So, uh, and I changed my mind about uh, several things during the course of the book. So you, you have to do that. I, I think. Probably the reason is because I was a physics major when I originally when I went to college and I understood the physics uh, and and I think understanding it uh, fear comes from lack of understanding and and I think I understood of it enough of it to know that there was not that much reason to be afraid of it and a lot of the lot of the public's negative opinions were coming from not understanding really what it, what it was about. It was nothing dramatic. It was an industrial facility. You know, it had concrete walls. It 
It, uh, it had a lot of pipes. Uh, <laughs> it had signs up, you know, caution radioactivity in certain places, but uh, it, it, was, it was an industrial plant. I think the, the by contrast, uh, having been in a coal plant, uh, the contrast was how incredibly much more noisy the, the coal plant was and how incredibly much more dirty it was. And uh, I think in that contrast, I, oh, I, I'm sorry, I was in Vermont Yankee too. Uh, I, I think the, the, real, the, the real impression is how clean the places are and how uh, spiffy and, and well designed and, uh, uh, you know, everybody's on the alert and, and uh, they're just, you know, there's a real esprit there that, that, uh, that you don't feel in an industrial, other industrial sites. I, I, I think Patrick, Patrick Moore has, has, has taken out the franchise on this. <laughs> I will simply repeat him. I would be happy to live in a nuclear plant. And I think I would probably be a lot healthier, but most people would be if they did. I, I, well, being a member of the media, I, I don't like to be critical, but I, I, I really think that, that that is a large, there is a problem there. Uh, I think the media tends to lag in their understanding. And so a lot of routinely uh, misrepresentative stuff gets, gets, gets repeated over and over and over again. And there's always the same qualifications. You know, well, we don't know they're completely safe yet. And, you know, maybe one of these decades we'll find out. And, and there's very little comprehension as, as to what, you know, what you, how anything can be 100% free of risk. Uh, but just, I mean, there's certainly some bad journalism about nuclear. I had a clipping that I carried out to Yucca Mountain where somebody described it as a nuclear dump, uh, an accident waiting to happen, and, and various, you know, the, you can, as a journalist, you soon learn that certain phrase, certain people, you can say almost anything you want about the mafia, <laughs> because the mafia is never going to come and come, like, hey, you know, you spelled my name wrong there. And, but uh, you can say anything, because it, and, and you can almost say anything you want about nuclear, and, and nobody will, can't, you know, certainly no copy desk editor will, will, will question it very seriously. Well, I think they've, run how to, uh, they've learned how to run nuclear reactors. I, I don't think anybody really understood how to run them. Uh, I, I think the most dramatic part of my book that I uh, en enjoyed learning about most was just the incredible isolation at the time of Three Mile Island, how every reactor was just an island unto itself. Nobody, uh, I think the, the figure was that uh, at Three Mile Island, they spent two hours a year talking about what was going on at other reactors. Nobody had any idea that each reactor was just kind of a, a, a custom-made, custom-designed, very eccentric, very weird <laughs> uh, technology. and. And nobody ever, there was no, never any cross-fertilization. Nobody ever moved from one reactor to another because they were all so totally, uh, just set up so totally different. And really nobody, the, 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 the conceit was that the, that the engineers could design them. They were so idiot-proof that nobody, and, and there were high school graduates running the reactor. And uh, I think after the Kemeny Commission caught that very, very nicely, and uh, the whole culture changed completely. So today, you, you, you know, you work, you train in a, as, a, as, a, as an apprentice in a reactor for five years before you can begin studying for your license with the NRC. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a life, it's like taking a medical degree uh, to, to go into a reactor op operating now. Even people who come out of the Navy for four years experience, they say that gets you in the door. Uh, so. The, the, the culture of, of understanding has improved so immensely. And of course, all this is reflected in the, basically in the capacity factor, which, which uh, has, has just, so I think we've learned everything, really.